Hello and welcome to Silux, the podcast where we talk about scientific developments and technological changes in Luxembourg. And as usual, we are powered proudly by Research Luxembourg. Today, our guest is Dr. Archibald Mposhi, a postdoctoral researcher at Luxembourg Institute of Health, so LIH, for some of you who know this abbreviation. Archibald, who holds a PhD from University of Groningen, will tell us more about the budding field of epigenetics. Archibald, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me. Do you mind if I call you Archie? Actually? Oh, yes, please. Because Archibald is a difficult name, That's I have to say. <laughs> yes, as well. And I have a feeling I will get it wrong and then I will have to cut it in. So good. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Epigenetics. Before you tell me what this epi is doing in front of genetics, I was just thinking that For me, genetics is one of those subjects like history of the 70s, that when you are at school, it's very much at the very end of all the studies and the teachers are like, yeah, you're almost graduating. Like, you know, we, we run through it. So I had a feeling that this was exactly for me with genetics. It's very important. You get just those few signposts and then you graduate from school and you never go back to it again. So I'm hoping that today, at least for me and for some listeners who don't have that knowledge, you'll be able to tell us, well, where are we with genetics and what actually is genetics itself before we say what epigenetics is? Yeah, sure. Hopefully I will be able to elaborate more on that subject. Yes. So tell me, when we talk genetics, we talk about DNA, right? So what is DNA? Maybe it's best for me to start by doubling back a little yes. bit and talking about the discovery of DNA itself. So this took place way back in the 19th century. So there was this uh, scientist, um, Frederick uh, Misser, if I'm not mistaken. He saw that uh, in white blood cells, there was a certain structure that looked, that he called it nuclear. And then from there on, there have been other scientists who have been trying to establish what this structure actually is. And so, as you will see from how I'm going to be explaining it, science is a collective activity, if I may put it that way. So later on, other scientists also started chipping in and also discovering different things about what this uh, nucleus, now we call it nucleus, actually contains. And we see that in the 1950s, when the technique of uh, X-ray crystallography was developed by uh, Rosalind Franklin, she saw that this nucleus contained sort of strands of a molecule, but of course they didn't know what it was. And then later on, other scientists started doing more research into it, and then they discovered that the components of this nucleus are actually important for inheritance. So passing down from generation to generation. And then later on in the discovery by Watson and Crick about the DNA structure. So they, they discovered that the DNA actually has a double helix uh, structure. I don't want to go too much into depth because then I'll start talking about the chemical compositions of DNA and all. But all I can say is that DNA, this is the basic blueprint of life. So from there on, we have the manual that depicts or that tells the story of your life even before you are born. And it's so fascinating, I have it to is, say, it really. Is, it is. First of all, it's beautiful because of that double helix, but it's also fascinating as a way of seeing so many different things. But then when we have DNA, we also have RNA. Yes. And what's that? So we have what we call messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is transcribed from DNA. So we have a dogma, it's called the central dogma, where we have DNA, and then we have RNA, and then we have protein. So um, we have DNA at the beginning, and that is transcribed or copied to mRNA. And mRNA is different from DNA in the sense that DNA is a double helix. And then for mRNA, this is just a single strand. And it is also some differences in terms of composition of the basis of mRNA. From mRNA, then we have translation of this mRNA into protein. Okay. Yeah. I said RNA, but you said mRNA. Oh, is yes. that the same or not? Well, it is the same. So there are many types of uh, RNA. We have the one that I'm talking about is uh, mRNA, which is messenger RNA. So this is what most people are familiar with. But we also have transfer RNAs as well. So, for example, during the uh, translation process, where you have the mRNA being translated to protein, 
you actually have tRNAs, transfer RNAs, that carry amino acids to the ribosomes where you get them being formed into polypeptides. So then you have also other types of RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, and all of them. It's quite a huge... <laughs> okay, I get it. Let's just stick to mRNA for okay, now. Okay, we'll stick to mRNA for now. <laughs> okay, I think we also discussed quite a lot of genetics because of the vaccine development, right? Oh, yes. So there was that part I think people could already learn something, but I still like discussing the buzzwords. And then somehow when I think genetics, I think DNA, RNA, and then I think gene expression. Oh, yes. And I, I don't know what it is, actually. I keep hearing people saying that, but I don't understand. It's like what, understanding what the genes are or, or what yeah. is it? Okay, so the DNA itself, it codes for what are known as genes. And these genes code for proteins that then can be an enzyme, it can be anything. So what happens basically is that when a gene is being expressed, we have that translation process that I just uh, mentioned prior. So we have translation, and that is what we call expression. That is gene expression. That is how a gene is expressed when it becomes um, a protein. And not just a protein. I want to further elaborate on that because you also have some non-coding parts of the DNA as well. So these can be coded to also long non-coding RNAs. So this also adds on to that. So the DNA not only codes for, for genes, but you also have non-coding RNAs also. You just opened up a world <laughs> and I'm thinking like, oh God, where's the exit? Oh where's yeah, the well, exit? there's no exit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really fascinating, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. But before, one of the exits, for me at least, is the pub quiz question because okay. we discussed a little bit what DNA is so we can now focus on your question. So listeners, remember, Archie prepared a question for you and the answer to this question will only be at the end of the podcast. So the question that I have for you is, which type of mature cell in the human body does not have DNA? A, white blood cell, B, neuron, C, T cell, and D, red blood cell. Okay, so I'm sure now you're rewinding to listen to it again. So you're like, okay, maybe this, maybe that. But remember, the good answer only at the end of the podcast, probably also on the web, but don't do this. Listen to the podcast first. So yes, you said there is one type of mature cell that does not have DNA, but most of the cells do. Yes. Right? So what happens that they actually become different cells? Yes. Yeah, so because it's the same DNA, or isn't it? It is the same DNA. That's the interesting part. So this is where the epi part comes into play. Because, well, we have all cells in the body having the same DNA, and then what determines in which direction a cell will go or what, what type a cell will be is the genes that are being switched on and off. So then we go on to the part of gene expression regulation, which is actually talking about epigenetics. Because depending on which genes are switched on, a cell can become maybe a, maybe a hepatocyte, that is a liver cell, and maybe depending on which genes are being switched off, it might become maybe a kidney cell. So then you, you do have those differences depending on which genes are being switched on and off. But who decides on this? It's a good question. You know, I love archaeology and I always like to draw parallels to what I do and, you know, other fields in science. And archaeology for me, it's the study of ancient relics and also studying ancient languages as well, those that have been lost in translation. So I kind of feel the same thing when we're dealing with DNA. It's like we are trying to make a translation of a language that we do not yet understand. But of course, we have made so much progress to this day that we at least can interpret or translate what certain parts of the DNA or certain genes are actually doing. So I think we are lucky in biology in the sense that DNA is interactive. So we can change expression of a particular gene to see what it actually 
does, what its function is. It's not like the languages because that, you know, you cannot just like say, yeah, help me, or dictionary, how do I translate that, yeah, right? exactly. And, 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 and to the question that you asked, like, who determines that? So that is something that actually starts during the early stages of uh, development. So from the time of uh, conception, so already you have cells that are like embryonic uh, stem cells that start to differentiate and, you know, changing into different uh, cell types. So at that stage, that's where every cell takes a particular route towards becoming a, a particular cell type. So is epigenetics studying why the genes are switched on and off? Or is it rather kind of analyzing different gene expression? What is the study of epigenetics doing, actually? What do you look at? I'm working in a multidisciplinary field. So it's a combination of psychology and biology. So basically, we know that depending on the psychological or your, your social environment, this can have an influence on how your genes function. So then we are mostly interested in seeing what these changes are. In a sense, we are trying to understand how your genes are interacting with the environment and how you are responding to these changes. And we see that on the epigenetic level, like we have ways of seeing what changes are taking place. And there are so many changes, as you will see, as I'll be uh, explaining, that there's not only one change that takes place, but several changes. And each change means a different thing. And some, we don't know. <laughs> That's where, what you're on to, right? To get to know why it's like that. Yeah. But wait, I always thought that it's, you know, more kind of a domain of psychology of discussing, okay, your environment influences how you behave and what happens to you later on. But there are also genes involved in that? Yes. Okay, yes. I must have missed that information. <laughs> yeah, so there are also genes that are involved. Maybe I should bring into context early life adversity. So this happens to be the field of study that I'm currently working in. So we are looking at the early life stage and seeing what happens during that stage because we believe from previous uh, studies that have been done by others before us and also us is that uh, during this uh, early life period, it's a developmental window by which there are a lot of things happening and also our genes can actually adapt to some of those changes and this can have uh, consequences later on in, in life. Putting this into context, our genes actually are very much involved and they interact with our environment. And this is something that over the past 30, 40 years, we are now beginning to understand in depth that this relationship or crosstalk between our genes and the environment is actually stronger than we thought previously. And yeah, it's, it's, it's actually opening up so many avenues for us to, to research. And we're actually getting so many questions coming up as we, as, we, as we go along. Of course, because it kind of makes you think, okay, you create the so-called perfect genome, but then, well, anyway, it's going to be actually developing differently depending on the environment. You will always have that holy grail somewhere there and chasing, you know. But this is something that we have known from from, from time. I think uh, from the early biologists when they're looking even from Mendel and, you know, like all these people, they have been seeing that there are some pressures from the environment that actually change the way in which our genes function. And this is good in a sense because it also helps us to adapt to the environment, to the changing environment. And it might be bad if it is a chronic or continuous stressor in the sense that, well, our bodies can then be drawn towards changing. It can be detrimental in the, in the long run. Before we discuss these adversities, I was just thinking that I think important information here is also that in this case, it's reversible, isn't it? So genome, we get for life, that's it. But with epigenetics, we can say, well, you change the environment, it can get better. Or we are not sure about this. Well, from the definition, of course, of epigenetics, it is reversible. So it means that these epigenetic changes, which I will uh, mention now, uh, can actually be removed. So I want you to understand also that in epigenetics, we have writers, we have readers, and we have erasers. So these are proteins that are actually 
writing these epigenetic marks and some are removing them. So the part of removing them, erasing them, that's the reversibility. So we have all these players in epigenetics and it's not just one, but several. And also depending on which cell type, a different writer can be expressed in a different cell type and a different eraser in a different cell type. So <laughs> it brings up the whole complexity of epigenetics. Which means that basically as a, a specialist in the field, you spend all your life looking only on one type of cells, right? You can't do more, I guess. Yeah, you, you are left to look at just one cell type or unless you have other, you know, that's the beauty of science anyway, that... Uh, we have the opportunity to collaborate with others as well in the field. So you might be just looking at one cell type, but then, you know, because you're collaborating with others who are also looking at others, then you can always uh, come back together and try to see what, how the connections, how all this is connecting and, and, and what have you. Yeah. But how do you study it, actually? You try to see, in this case, the early life adversities. You have to, first of all, find people like that, and then you see what happens with them later, and then you have also a control group. So that's basically the, the usual design of the study. Exactly. But how do you know that it's actually epigenetics and not something else? Okay, so you've brought up a, a, an interesting question. This is something that has been difficult to, to actually answer that question because when you look at a population of people, there is a lot of heterogeneity, like people are different. And so it will be difficult, of course, to see what is the influence of the environment and then people just being people. So this maybe brings into light the project that we are currently doing called uh, Immunotween. So this is part of a bigger project known as Twin Life. It's a German uh, cohort of twins. So we are mostly interested in monozygotic uh, twins. So these are twins that have the same genetic background. So when you have participants who have the same genetic background, then you are to some extent sure that whatever change you will see during their life is as a result of the environment and not per se anything to do with their genetic uh, background because it's the same. But you focus on the early life problems. I guess the chances that those twins have gone through something different in their early lives is less. You don't find that many, do you? True, that's true. So, you know, it then puts us back to the field of psychology. So there is something called perceived stress, right? It can also happen that maybe one twin perceives a certain stressor as very stressful and another one may also perceive it as normal. So that happens. Those are differences that okay. And of course, we are looking at not only the, the, the very, very early, though this is a question also that is debatable on how long this early life period is because we from from the definition that we use it's the first 1000 days after conception after two years so that's the early life uh, period but some have extended it further to go on to looking at uh, maybe six years and so and others are also even looking at adolescence as well because there are a lot of changes that are also taking place uh, during that time and we see a lot of uh, divergence even in twins as well. As they reach adolescence, they start to, to diverge as well. Yeah. Okay, so what have you found out so far? Of course, I have to ask <laughs> about results. <laughs> Terrible journalists. Okay. So, well, I can say that uh, for now, we have actually started uh, analyzing uh, data from like doing preliminary analysis of data from this cohort. And we are seeing some interesting uh, things so far. We do see some uh, differences that we think are biologically relevant. In the next months, we are going to be integrating the biological part with the psychology part because, if, for example, in the Immunotween project, we have the biology part, which is we collect blood from these uh, participants, we collect saliva, and then we do all the tests to see what changes are taking place and also looking at epigenetics. And then we have the psychology part where they are doing questionnaires on these uh, twins, participants, you know, so then in the end, we'll have to integrate our data and then see where the environmental uh, factors, socioeconomic uh, factors have an impact on one's epigenome. Sure. And what do we know right now 
<laughs> before before your study is finished what is what are the assumptions what are the hypotheses in the field well we, we actually recently published um, last year uh, where we introduced a new hypothesis in the field which we call the stem cell hypothesis so in this hypothesis that we proposed we propose that during the early life stage when an individual is exposed to certain uh, stresses be it socioeconomic abuse what have you even pollutants as well this has an effect on their stem cells and because stem cells are then dividing and uh, differentiating into all these other cell populations we think that because the stem cells are affected that's why even after 20 years you still see the same phenotype we actually had a, a, a study that we did here in luxembourg where we looked at children who had been institutionalized in orphanages and then readopted in luxembourg and there we saw that they still had some changes that still could be seen 24 years down the line so it means there's something going on there so it's not just the adult cells because they die but then with the stem cells they keep on producing more and more cells and that's why we continue to see the same phenotype even after some time this is very interesting i have to <laughs> so, say yeah, so, so this is what we have so far and more is still coming yeah of course so you need to definitely <laughs> uh, check what uh, archie is writing about and and his teams and whatever and you know look out for the immuno twin you said that's the project and twin life the big one as well but it's also what was interesting for me is that it's very interdisciplinary as well so you probably have to spend a lot of time also understanding each other or How is that going? That is true. So I am purely I'm, I'm a biologist and when I started this project uh, about a year and a half ago this was my first time actually you know like interacting with psychologists and you know trying to understand this field of psychology it is interesting. I must say that um, I've learned quite a lot in the past uh, one and a half years and well it's it's not just psychologists also but you have other people also taking part in it you have expertise you know like different people you know it's 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 so, it's, it's so nice <laughs> working in such an environment yeah of course i do see it as future of science for sure you know we we kind of for too long been in those silos uh, uh, one scientist one field uh, two three scientists but not really crossing the same at school right you know you study biology or you study chemistry and it should be all it is all related you know it would be so good to actually see the links clearer well science is not a one man band you know it's an orchestra so each person is playing their own tune but everything is just coming together to just make one nice melody <laughs> at least that's what you're hoping for right oh, that's what you're hoping for that's what that, that's the best case scenario because i did hear some out of tune music sometimes as well from scientists i have to say but that's just my personal opinion <laughs> okay um but you know this is your field so these uh, adversities in in early life stages but There's way more to epigenetics, right? What are the other things people look at? There's some link epigenetics and cancer development as well, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Actually, most of the studies that have been done in epigenetics are in cancer. And we see that there are changes in how the genome functions in in, in cancer cells for example, and there are a lot of changes that are taking place. Some oncogenes are being uh, switched on. So for example we know that when we have methylation which is also an epigenetic mark when it is on certain regions of the DNA it can be a promoter it can mean something so for example if you have methylation taking place within the promoter of a gene then you have switching off of that gene and then when you have it within the gene it could actually mean that the gene is switched on and it's being expressed so in cancer we have learned all that but then i also want to bring to your attention that it's not black and white because when you look at cancer it's very complex it's a metabolic disease as well and epigenetics is actually adding on to the complexity of all that but in our effort to understand it we have to take everything apart and look at everything sort of individually and then try to put the picture back together again so indeed there is a lot of epigenetics in in cancer like a lot of studies are being 
done. Being done. Yeah, they're being done. Yeah, sure. And also, you know, you mentioned that in your case, you're looking more at the environment, but we could also talk about diet, right? Is that also something that influences uh, how the genes are expressed? Yes, well, also diet, it does to an extent. It, it does affect because I might be tempted to move a little bit back and talking about food and also talking about uh, mitochondria, for example. I don't know what the listeners know about mitochondria, but of course, this is basically the powerhouse of the cell. Well, that's the general term. But then we also find that it also helps in converting, like if you eat food or whatever, it helps to convert all that to to energy. So we find that the mitochondria, even now, we are seeing that in the field of uh, psychoneuroimmunology. <laughs> Whoa, what a word. <laughs> We're actually finding that uh, mitochondria actually also play an important role. And this is where nutrition also comes into play because then if you are deficient of a certain nutrient and stuff, that can actually affect you in a sense and that has long-term implications later on. Let's take, for example, there have been studies that have been done in for the Mediterranean diet. And there they have seen that people who take the Mediterranean diet, there are changes that take place in their epigenome as well. And to some extent, the mitochondria are actually involved. The mechanisms are quite uh, complex, but there is also the, the involvement of mitochondria. So the diet can influence uh, your epigenome in that sense. And then we also talk about the mitochondrial diseases, or that's not it? Yeah, well, we can talk about mitochondrial diseases, but this is something on the side. So when we talk about mitochondrial diseases, mostly these are diseases that arise as a result of mitochondrial dysfunction. So it can be that uh, maybe a certain gene is not expressed that is important for the functioning of mitochondria. Actually, some years back, I worked on a project where we looked at patients who suffered from myopathy. So in these patients, there was no genetic alteration, so there were no mutations in their genome, but still they showed all the signs and symptoms of myopathy, which is fatigue and, in what of you, mitochondrial dysfunction. So we took this uh, unique group of patients and we sequenced their DNA and we also looked at their mitochondrial DNA. And what we found was that there was actually some changes, some subtle changes in their mitochondrial DNA. So this is interesting that uh, you also find that mitochondria, apart from the nucleus, they are the organelle that has their own DNA that codes for proteins that are essential for their functioning. So that's another DNA that's also important to talk about. <laughs> so next time when someone sequences their genome, I actually have to ask them, which one was it, right? <laughs> Usually it's, well, they sequence the nuclear, but also the mitochondrial DNA is also part of, you cannot, uh, like every time they sequence, it's there in the mix. You cannot okay. get rid of it. It's there. <laughs> okay, so you can check that too then. Yes, you can check okay, it. I have well. no idea. Have you done it actually? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. Have. yeah. Like most of my work, uh, previous work, uh, I was working on mitochondrial DNA, and when I started this uh, in this field, it was fairly new. And also talking about epigenetics in mitochondria, it was something that uh, not many people were willing to, you know, to 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 really accept. And some were actually saying, no, I don't think this actually happens. So we went into the lab and then we started to test to, to see whether we could see it. And also we developed tools that enabled us to actually induce epigenetic changes. So this is the beauty of science in that you can have your own toolbox where you can write certain marks on the DNA and see what the function is. So that is what we did. We methylated the mitochondrial DNA and then we started looking at the functional biological relevance of it. Of course, it was an artificial system, but at least in terms of proving the concept, it managed to at least 
in that context, they managed to prove it. <laughs> okay, so I get it. So when you're inducing epigenetic changes, it's not that you're introducing stressors like shouting at the mitochondria or something, right? It's, <laughs> no. it's more about actually doing the methylation. This would be doing actually the methylation. But also when we look at, uh, when we're doing our um, experiments, for example, we do have experiments where we introduce certain stressors. So, for example, we have the cold presser test where I asked you to maybe put your hand in cold water and then, you know, like that makes you get stressed up. And this actually activates the HPA axis, which is the important uh, axis that is involved in a uh, stress response. So then you have uh, the release of uh, cortisol which some term the stress hormone. We see that uh, when we introduce stresses, for example, in, in our lab animals, we do see some changes that, uh, that take place, mostly in the immune system, for example. So we think that mostly these stresses also not only affect the brain, but also the, the immune system is a, is a target for these stresses. Okay, wow, a lot to still check and to find out and test and stress people. I'm happy you're not actually making me put my hand into cold water or whatever. I just, I, I, you know, I probably you did introduce a stressor because I was already imagining doing that. I was not enjoying myself. Although I've been planning to, you know, have baths in winter. So maybe I'm already the, the one that would not be that stress, you know, but still, still, let's leave it at that place. And I just wanted to touch upon Last subject before we solve the pub quiz question, of course, is that, well, your supervisor uh, was nominated last year for the FNR Award for uh, Outstanding Mentorship. And I just wanted to ask you, because this is also a subject that I that is dear to my heart. Actually, the first episode of this season was all about mentorship in academia. We we're discussing a lot about that. So what is a good mentor for you? I'm not asking, tell me how John Turner is, your, your supervisor, but just in general, what, what do you think? Because I do believe it's important and I think you would agree with me that academia is a place where you need mentors, don't you? Yeah, indeed, indeed. I think, well, in my own perspective, a good mentor is somebody who propels you. So as an understudy, when you're working under them, they should be able to give you that opportunity to stretch your wings and fly and also give you guidance because then you can fly in the wrong direction. <laughs> so there has to be that uh, mix between them affording you the opportunity to explore, to you know think outside the box, but yet also bringing you back and saying, well, this is the way that you should go. So I think the mentoring process is very important in academia because then it also helps in you know generating the next generation of scientists you know because what is science in the end like what are we doing what we are doing is just making steps that other people will build on so it's good for us to keep the the continuity and that can only happen if we are able to mentor the people who will be carrying on the research like long after we're gone. So I think a mentor, a good mentor, not only looks at now, at publishing papers, getting things done, but also looking into the future and thinking, okay, how can we make this field go forward? How can we, you know, propel these young scientists into the future? So I, I think that's that's what a good mentor looks at, not just the now, but looking into the future. Yeah, yeah I, I like that a lot. And if you're interested in, in Archie's uh, supervisor or in general in mentorship, there's quite a lot uh, you can check out. I will also publish some links in the show notes for you to see for yourself what the mentors in Luxembourg are doing and what are the discussions as well linked to the previous episode will follow. And the last thing that remains right now is to go back to our pub quiz question. So as usual, if you can repeat the question, first of all, for those who don't remember it, and then please tell us what the answer was. Okay, so the question was, which type of mature cell in the human body does not have DNA? Is it the white blood cell, the neuron, the T cell, or the red blood cell? And the answer is? The red blood cells. The red blood cell, why? Well, that's an interesting question. But then it also goes to their function. 
So red blood cells are important for carrying oxygen. So the nucleus probably is taking up too much space. And so it's actually in the mature red blood cells taken out. It's actually removed. So the mechanisms around that are still being investigated. But we know that mature red blood cells do not have DNA. And so their primary basic function is to carry as much oxygen as they can. Okay. Wow. So interesting. Thank you so much for today, Archie. It was a really a pleasure. And I think at the very end of the podcast, I can admit that I feel very bad that I hated biology at school because <laughs> <laughs> if it was done maybe in a different way, I would have been really passionate about it because I have to say what you said today was very, very interesting. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you for having me. And this is it for today. Don't forget to subscribe, to follow us, to check what we are writing on all the social media and everywhere else you can follow us. And of course, suggest guests, uh, comment on the episode or just yeah, say hello if you can. This was uh, Silex and my name is Hanna Szymaszko. Mm-hmm.